This is going to be a basic video on how to carve a otter letter opener. Now by the end of this, sometimes the otters end up looking a little bit more muskratish or lizardish. Yeah, whatever works. So we're going to take a blank. These blanks are cut out of butternut. It's a nice soft wood that has an easy to see grain direction. You can see these stripes running through the wood. Grain direction is going to be something very important that we're going to be working with. Using our knife, we're going to be cutting it out, shaping all the edges, getting to a creature that looks about like this, and then finally sanding and sealing for our finished product. This particular creature I left ears on so that's why he looks a little bit different than the one above. Pretty much the only tools you're going to need this time around. Your carving glove, safety first. This is just a cut resistant glove. I've added some puff paint polka dots to for a little bit of extra grip. My trusty little thumb guard, which I just created in another little video, custom fit, made out of self-adhesive bandage. Very useful and inexpensive, easy to get a hold of. And a straight carving knife. This particular knife is by OCC Tools. It's their Scout version. Uh, I like this one because it fits my hand really well. It doesn't have a really big bulky handle. Uh, and the blade isn't too long and it's not too short, so it's just a, a good overall length the size for for my hand. Some people like a bigger blade, some people like a smaller blade. Kind of personal preference. So with this otter, paying attention to grain direction, as a reminder we're going to be working downhill with the grain. So here's our grain direction going across. We're going to be working from the back down towards the neck and from the top of the head down towards the back of the neck. If you work from the back down, do not turn your blade and expect to go back up the back of the head. If you try to do that, your blade will catch and you're going to tear out a huge chunk of the back of your otter's head and nobody wants that. So we're going to go downhill, downhill, downhill towards the nose, downhill towards the tail, Flip the animal around. Here we're going to go from the feet downhill to the nose, feet downhill to the belly, feet downhill to the belly, feet downhill to the base of the tail, and then tail to the base of the tail. Again, do not try and curve around or you will end up with tear out and an otter who's missing chunks and pieces, which is very sad. For this creature, it's relatively simplistic. There's not a whole lot of change in the profile here, in the top-down profile. Pretty much the only lines that you're going to need to worry about are the high point on the tail. But you can take a pen, a pencil, and figure out where your midline is. About right there for me. And a little carpenter trick here is to angle your pen about while putting your finger right against the side of your wood, angling that pen over, and just dragging while still pushing or touching your finger against the side of your wood all the way up. You get a nice straight line. There you have your midline. We're going to leave that line alone as we're carving. This is going to be the top of our triangle. The base of the tail here on the side is going to be the bottom of our triangle. So one point, two point, three point. And we're going to shave down these edges here to make a triangle in cross section to give our tail the letter opener aspect. Now you can also figure out how narrow or thick you want your tail to be. Let me give this one a little bit narrower tail. I've done some chunky tails. 
find it easier when I'm tapering to carve off these corners first before we start worrying about tapering our edges. But we'll come back to that in a little bit. I also like to bring in just the side of the tail a little bit just to give a little bit more dimension to the piece. You don't have to, but just to, to do a little bit more, more practice and a little difference. So we've got our, our tail edge in here, little tail edge in here, coming kind of up right between there-ish. Eh, kind of wobbly on both sides, so roundabout. And then I'm going to just tuck this in a little bit. Again, you don't have to, but it's a good practice. So it's just going to be a little bit of a, a tuck in on the side of the tail. Let's see where I tucked it in right here. Not a lot. Just a little. We're going to tuck in the neck too, but we'll deal with that a little bit later. Otters have relatively thick necks. Otters and weasels have relatively thick necks, so you don't have to tuck it in too terribly much. And with that, I think we're pretty much ready to get started. All right, just so I don't forget later, I think the first thing I'm going to start with, working on the profile of the tail tip. So with this, we're pretty much only going to be using push cuts and pull cuts. Don't really need to worry about stop cuts on this one. And go with the grain. So downhill with the grain, whether that's on the side profile, top down, doesn't matter. You're going with the grain. close on that side. And pretty close on that side. There we go. Tail a little bit narrowed. Don't have to worry about taking off too big a pieces. You can always go back later and take off more. And then I'm going to work on this little divot next. So for the divot, you want to go very shallow cuts, and I'm going to go away from myself, about halfway, and I'm going to turn my knife around and do a pull cut, come back towards myself. Now, your chip may not release right away, that's okay, just go back, hit it again, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And eventually, those chips will release. shallow. You don't want it very big. Some people prefer one method of cut over another. Maybe you like just doing the push cuts. Um, bad part about just doing one cut is you would need to turn the animal around to hold on and the tail doesn't give you a lot to hold on to. So trying to do another cut with very little holding on to makes it a little slippery. So this will be good practice for push cut, switching that blade around, pull cut, push cut, pull cut. And then we'll do the other side. Now we're going to start rounding. I'm actually going to start with the head and the shoulders first before we get back to the tail. 
It'll just be easier for a little bit more practice. So we're going to go from the top, downhill, top, downhill. Same thing where you're going to go downhill and you're going to stop, take your blade out, come back to the top of the head, and pull cut towards yourself to get rid of those chips. You're going to end up with fuzzies here, just like you ended up with fuzzies here. Don't worry, you can take care of those with sandpaper. You can even just do a whole bunch in one direction first, leave all those fuzzies in place, and then come back the other direction. Just like that start our rounding. For the, for the body, we're going to start from the flat, work all the way over to the flat to get rid of this corner. And same thing here. I'm going to work from this flat on the back all the way over to this flat. As your creature gets rounder and rounder, the chips that you'll be removing are going to be smaller and smaller. Now towards the front of the nose. I'm not going to give this one ears. Now for under here, bottom of the chin, we have to watch that grain direction again. We need to go downhill, which means going from the feet down towards the jaw and the chin. Same thing with the belly, feet to the belly, feet to the belly. Don't curve around. For the feet themselves, you can either leave them square, or if you want to continue the rounding all the way down to the feet, you can have little ovals. The last little bit here from the tail, same thing, going from the feet deep and from the tail deep.
but leaving this flat part of the tail alone. Just cleaning up some of the ovals on the feet a little bit. Any little cleanup you can do will save you time sanding later. All right, onto the tail in the back. So we've got most of the front half shaped. We're onto the back half. Again, leaving the high point intact cutting up to it but not through it. Same thing with our outer edge here on the very bottom where it's touching the table. Cutting to it, not through it. Start with your high point and you work down from there. I kind of move back and forth and back and forth a little bit, slowly working down that high point. And I want the tip of my tail to be flatter, more letter opener like, and the base of my tail is going to be more rounded. As I get most of the bulk off, now my chips are going to be much smaller as I creep closer and closer. blade-like edge here. You can see where the light is reflecting off of it. Still have a big flat part there. So now we have a little bit more flat feeling right here. It starts to be a little bit more curved right up in here. Now we're going to repeat that on the other side. I'm just going to blend the back half of the body, the hips, into the tail. Keeping this nice rounded profile in here, keeping more blade-like back there. So this I'm going to keep nice and triangular, and I'm going to slowly transition into a nice rounded back end. Again, going from the top down, I am going to hit a pop point in the middle here where I may have to go back and forth depending on which side of the grain I'm closest to if there's any high spots. It's worth rotating it back and forth and back and forth to avoid tear out. Mm -hmm. 
All right, now we're to the point where it's just fine-tuning some of that carving. I would suggest just running your fingers across the piece, looking for any high spots or glaring errors. Um, and if you can take those down with a knife, it's going to really speed up your sanding. I'll thin down around the neck just a little bit, but not a lot. And weasels have really thick necks. They're basically just giant furry meat tubes. All right, I'm pretty happy with that. Now it's on to sanding. There's no real big secret to sanding, just time. What I'm gonna be using here are a couple of different grits. Butternut is a really soft wood, so I don't want anything that's a really low number. The lower your number on the sandpaper, the rougher the grit, so I'm not going to be using anything like a 60 or an 80 or a 100 because they have bigger grits glued to the sandpaper, which means that as you go across the softwood, it's going to make score marks. And butternut is so soft, we really don't need to worry about that. So I'm going to start with a 220, and then as I progress, I'm going to go to a 320, and then probably after I seal it, I'll actually go towards like a 600. This is actually a foam pad with a sanding grit attached right to it. It's nice and flexible. I can get into nice curved surfaces with these. I love these. These are great. So for just the normal sandpaper, uh, what I do is I usually hold them with an old sanding block. So I've gone through many blocks over the years. And I hate throwing these away because they're such a good size. And even though the grit loses its grittiness, I can still just wrap new sandpaper around them and hold onto it. So this works really well for a form to give you more of a solid base, even though it's still a little squishy, to get over all of our surfaces. You're also going to see me pop on occasion with these microfiber cloths. These are fantastic for getting into all of the grain of your wood to pull off your wood dust and it keeps the dust down in your house. So I really like using those to, to help dust off the piece as I'm working. And you can also use it to dust off your sandpaper. That way it doesn't get too clogged up. The nice thing about this too is because it's a slightly more straight line solid block, I can use these against my sides for the tail too to help them keep their shape.
can also take just the sandpaper itself. This is just a smaller 220 and wrap it around a dowel rod or your finger in order to get tighter curves. You can already see a little bit of what I'm doing right here. I'm curling the paper on edge and then sanding down to make that divot a little bit bigger, creating a sharp edge. It just creates kind of a neat little visual abstract bit. Okay, looks like we're pretty much ready for sealing. All right, so I'm gonna be using Bartley Gel Stain Clear Coat. Uh, everybody swears by their own favorites. This just happens to be my favorite. I've used spray on, I've used paint on, I've used wipe on, wipe off. Uh, I just really like how this one works. It's got a really nice finish. I like my pieces to be handled, and because of that, I spend a lot of time sealing and sanding in between coats because I like a nice smooth finish. So here I've got a little bit of the gel stain, clear coat, wipe it on. There we go. I'm just going to let it sit for a couple of minutes, let that soak in, and then I'll wipe off the surface and let it cure, sand in between coats, and then seal it again. Mm -hmm. 